welcome to Maven, spirited by AJU. My name is Alyssa Silva, and I'll be your host today for this fantastic event. Today, we'll be discussing all things feminism and Judaism. We'll explore themes of intimacy, love and loss, war, belonging, and so much more. Frankly, I'm honored to welcome our two speakers, Anita Diamond, who is the author of the foreword for this book, Frankly Feminist, and a New York Times bestseller, uh, has a New York Times bestseller, The Red Tent, which is a book that I joke is the only thing I read in college. For fun, I mean, of course. Um, we're also joined by editor-in-chief of Lilith Magazine, Susan Weedman Schneider, one of the founding mothers of Lilith and uh, a fantastic individual who has really been the catalyst for all things feminism and Judaism, especially in the literary world. Um, welcome to you both. So excited that you're here. And I really wanna kick things off uh, with a question to Susan. Uh, can you share with us a little bit of the inspiration for Lilith Magazine and how has it evolved over the years since its inception in 1976? Well, it's an interesting question. Lilith was created at a moment when all periodicals in the Jewish world, with the exception of one academic journal, were edited by men, including the venerable Hadassah magazine, representing an organization of Jewish women, was edited by a man. And in the feminist world, there was not a, an interest really in exploring the particularities of women who might diverge from whatever the American norm was. And that is to say, there wasn't a real interest in women who belonged to different ethnic groups, racial groups, religious traditions, from what was considered then sort of the American mainstream. And what that meant was that for Jewish feminists, any desire that we had to explore the tradition to figure out where was the growing room within Judaism? How could the tradition be stretched? And we knew that it could be to accommodate women's desires for learning, for, for acting as clergy, for having their writings appreciated. Um, there, wasn't much interest in the general feminist media at that point. It was more sort of the throw out the baby with the bathwater if the religious tradition is sexist or has misogynist tendencies, walk away. And that wasn't particularly what so many of us were interested in doing. So it was a very exciting time and really continues to be. Some of the issues, of course, are evergreen. We now have women in the pulpit, more women in rabbinical schools these days than men, in fact. And we have women whose writings are, as you, you know, from the huge success of Anita's book, The Red Tent, and her other writings, an enormous appetite for looking at Jewish traditions through women's eyes. Incredible. Thank you so much for that insight. And, you know, in that same vein, over the years, have you seen any big changes in the pieces that are being submitted or the topics that you're writing on? Well, it, that's an interesting question because there's a difference between the submissions we get that are fiction and the submissions that are uh, either first person narrative writing, memoir, um, reported pieces, investigative journalism. The fiction that we get has really, I think, shifted from the early years, when we'll, the kind of writing we were seeing in the 1970s and let's say, uh, first half of the 80s, largely those were short stories that, that came to us unbidden. There was no internet. There was no way that we could cast our net wide with the exception of when we would give talks or advertise Lilith's fiction uh, opportunities in various magazines for writers. What we saw were a lot of stories that we would term ancestor worship. You know, a lot of stories that were looking at Bible women and Midrashic subjects, but also um, what were our own grandmothers like? Hmm. What, what did our families look like a generation back? And that hasn't changed so much, but because 
we now can cast our net very wide and invite submissions from a very wide range of women, women around the world who are writing in English, as sometimes in Hebrew and Yiddish and French, we've run translations from those wow. languages. That's amazing. But mostly English. And we now have a fiction contest. So we're publishing more fiction than we ever did. And that in itself is a is a pretty powerful magnet for people to send in their writing. So I would like to also just say that there are very few magazines that are publishing fiction um, and that are open to publishing first time writers. So yeah. um, all, and that has nothing to do in the Jewish community, in the larger media world. Um, I used to work for the Boston Globe Sunday Magazine, used to publish fiction all the time. It's been decades since they did that. So um, you, you would not only were a groundbreaker, but you continue to offer a venue that really doesn't exist pretty much anywhere. It's very rare. Yes, outside the literary magazine. Right, right. Here, it's a very right. small world. <laughs> it's a very small world, the literary magazines. And we have been delighted with the fiction that Lilith has published. So it was a huge challenge making the selections that went into, <laughs> yeah. into our new book. Uh, it took us a very long time. My co-editor, Yona Zeldis McDonough, and I labored really actively for a couple of years, two full years, making the choices. In the meantime, Yona, who's a very accomplished novelist, was publishing her, I think, her 10th and 11th novels when we were doing this work. And I was editing Lilith magazine and running Lilith, the nonprofit organization at the same time. But um, it was a pleasure, I mean, a real labor of love reading through the hundreds of short stories that we had published over the years. And Yona, bless her heart, winnowed those hundreds down to a list of, I think, 87 or 88 finalists. Wow. From which we chose 44. And near the end, it was a little like, you know, trading cards. Well, you know, do <laughs> we can convince the publisher, like, can we get five more pages? We were in the bargaining process. Yeah. Did you disagree at all at the very end there? I was having two editors, um, you know, I, I, I love this one. I love this one more. We didn't arm wrestle or anything at the end. I mean, we had our favorites. And I think we managed to tuck all our favorites in. Um, certainly both of us would have wished for volume two and volume three. And who knows, maybe those will come. I was going to say, I'm sure, you know, I see a future here. <laughs> well, and I'm sure that the future of the fiction Lilith publishes will look even more different than what these stories look than how these stories mm -hmm. look different from what we published 30 years ago. Yeah. Certainly there are more voices from non-binary Jews, from trans Jews, from not only Jews of color, but Jews from communities that are both like our own and very unlike our own. Um, we see it now with a couple of projects Lilith Magazine has in the works, which is to bring in and nurture emerging writers. So someone is writing of her experience being on a farm and eating meat and managing to kosher kill her own animals for meat. I mean, this is not likely to have been a story we would have seen a few decades ago. That particular piece is not fiction, but you see, I'm sure, what I mean about the range of subjects and how that shifts has shifted. Absolutely. And, you know, Anita, I'm curious from your perspective as a, a very successful, um, you know, fiction writer, especially in the biblical realm, um, in the realm of Judaism, you know, how did you, how were you able to infiltrate that world? You know, what have you seen change over the years? Um, and has Lilith magazine and, and this institution influenced you at all? Well, I feel like I'm part of this history that we share, actually. I, I feel like um, I've been aware of Lilith, I think, from the very beginning mm -hmm. um, and uh, have seen most of the issues, <laughs> um, if not all of them. So it's it's been this growth of uh, presence, as you said before, Susan, that um, where there were no women rabbis, now there are many. Um, where there was no theology written by women, now there's a lot. Uh, and so, you know, I feel very much a part of that. Um, I um, I don't, I wrote The Red Tent. That's the one and only novel I've written about 
you know, biblical characters. And I, I've been asked to go back and I never will. I just can't do it mm -hmm. again. It would be, it would not be as good. <laughs> um, but um, I, yeah, I just feel like part of a wave that is continuing to land on the shore with with new voices and new faces. I'm very interested in the, you know, in the Ladino and the, and the Mizrahi universes, which um, have so much to teach us in terms of everything, especially food, big fan um, of the whole, the, the fact that there's this, these other cuisines makes you realize that there's this other culture with other stories, with other kinds of humor, with other kinds of jokes that, you know, we're so Ashkenazic, we're so Eastern European, the American Jewish community is largely that, but um, it's wonderful to be growing in that direction as well. So, um, and I, I'm not, I don't feel like I'm part of that wave. I am part of the, you know, Ashkenazic European, Eastern European wave, but um, I'm thrilled to be watching it uh, develop and show up. Yeah, 100%. And, you know, what are both of your hopes for how this book might impact uh, the Jewish feminist movement or just the, the global feminist movement in general, both in the Jewish and secular world? Well, there's a small question. Um, <laughs> We're, we do heavy hitters here. I don't know if we can warn you about that, but <laughs> one of the things that I that I really have been struck by, as I've been, of course, rereading the stories in Frankly Feminist, and I've been on the road a bit for the book, I'm struck again and again by the diversity of the perspectives in these short stories. In these 44 stories, there are, as you point out, Anita. Uh, Mizrahi voices, voices of Jews from the Mediterranean, from North Africa. Um, the voice, uh, one of the protagonists is an Ethiopian woman who has walked from in that in that ex extraordinary trek across the Sudan to make it from Gondar province, from the mountains of Ethiopia, across the Sudan, into uh, ultimately ending up in Israel. So we have here not only differences in geography and differences in language of origin and differences certainly in point of view, but a real difference in the eras and the experiences that each one of these short stories foregrounds. I think that's enormously important because I think you have quite justly, Anita, pointed out the kind of solipsism that we all live with. We all tend to be in our own, as it were, silos or echo chambers or bubbles. And it's absolutely thrilling to read about and hence empathize with people whose struggles are different from our own. You know, and as Jews in particular, we know no matter what our background, that there is a kind of push-pull. We like to be inside our own communities and that's part of the insularity. And on the other hand, we live in that liminal space between the Jewish world, however we define it, and the outside world or the rest of that world. So there's a pull toward endogamy, toward staying within your, your community and maybe finding your partner within that community. And then there's the pull of the non-you, of that exotic or exogamous world. And it's one of the reasons why there's a whole section in the book, Frankly Feminist, about transgressive relationships. One of the sections is called transgressions. And another is called intimacies. Uh, the short stories aren't aren't organized chronologically, not chronologically by when they're set, nor chronologically uh, according to when they appeared in the magazine. But they're really they organize themselves really according to theme. And one of the themes that I found really interesting was that sort of insider outsider perspective. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, touching on, you know, you mentioned these sections or these, you know, sections that you split it up into for everyone. When you go and you buy the book, you will see that each story, every story within here, every short story is split throughout these certain sections, um, sections like body and soul, worn transgression, all of these things, you know, and Anita, I'm so curious, how did you come up with the title for these sections? Was it 
or sorry, Susan, sorry about that. Susan, how did you come up with the titles of these sections? Um, was it something that spoke to you after, you know, there was, you know, a certain amount of short stories that fit into a certain category, or did you come up with the categories before and then sifted things into it? How, how did that creative process work? It was really a very organic, intuitive process, I have to say. We did not come up with the categories first. The stories really kind of conversed with themselves. That's going to sound a little mystical and probably a little absurd. But um, mm -hmm. the first section, which really takes us through the life cycle, kind of shaped itself. The very first story in the book has its narrator in her mother's womb. I mean, it's not mm -hmm. often that you have yeah. one embryo speaking. It's a short <laughs> story called The New World by Esther Singer Kreitman, the far less well-known sister of Isaac Basheva Singer and I.J. Singer. Um, and of course, we know I.B. I. Singer is the author of Yentl and the Nobel Prize winner. And the older sister of these two boys, also a gifted writer, had her early writings destroyed by their mother, who felt that if word got out that she was a writer, that she would be rendered unmarriageable. And this story called The New World is about what she discovered she wants to get out. She's in this cramped space. She's in the womb. She gets out and the world is not exactly as she would have dreamed it to be. It's not such a welcoming place for a newborn Jewish girl. And, and then there were some stories. Myla Goldberg, whose novel Bee Season is probably her best known novel, has a marvelous story here about a young pre-adolescent girl at summer camp and the indignities that she suffered and how she gets back at everybody. And, and that section, as I say, the, the section entitled Transitions was pretty easy to yeah. put together. There's a story about a death, about an unveiling, a, a wonderful story about a wedding in Persia mm -hmm. by, by Gina Nahai. And the rest of the stories really were, as I say, um, grouped together almost the way iron filings are drawn to a magnet. We knew that a lot of these stories dealt with behaviors that crossed boundaries, whether it was between a parent and a child or whether it was um, a relationship within a marriage or a partnership that was under stress and why those stories, I think, are among the most powerful in the book. Mm -hmm. There's another section called Body and Soul. Again, those stories, as with the stories in the first section through the life cycle, found their own home. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the, the concluding section is entitled To Belong. And that is really where we have stories of people wrestling with insider outsider status mm -hmm. in what I think are pretty powerful ways. The story about the Ethiopian woman who comes to Israel and finds all of her assumptions challenged, turned upside down. What a girl is supposed to be, how a woman is supposed to live, yeah. what a marriage is supposed to be like. Uh, and some of the stories are very funny, including the concluding story by Naomi Seidman called Raised by Jews. <laughs> a story. I, I love all the stories. It's not fair to choose favorites because I was going to ask you, though, do you have a favorite? Are you allowed to say or is it like children? <laughs> well, I was going to say, yes, one's always in trouble with this. I have to say I really, really enjoy them all. I love the ones that have surprises and they're all, you know. Yeah. Anita, I'm sure that you have found this with your with your novels um, as well, that modern storytelling, I can say this, I don't write fiction, so um, I can I can make pronouncements without <laughs> feeling that my own writing is going to be judged by them. Uh, I think really excellent fiction is more open ended than it used to be. As my co-editor, Jonas Eldis McDonough, said to me one day in the beginning when we were making the choices, I said, we believe these are 
quote, modern, unquote, stories. You know, what makes a story modern? And she said, they are not tied with a neat bow at the end. They have surprises. Mm -hmm. They have openings for the reader to sort of mm, read through from her own perspective. And I think that's one of the things that I really enjoy about all of these stories is that they are, I won't say a little untidy because they're marvelously written, all of them, but they do, um, they do welcome us into universes that can still take us by surprise. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, you know, I think for myself, when I, when I was reading these stories, like you said, you know, there's all these plot twists happening, these open endings where you can add your own future for these characters. Um, for, you know, for example, in the, in the Persian wedding uh, story that you had mentioned, right, the entire time I'm reading it, I'm saying, oh, no, this is going to end like every other, you know, wedding story that we hear of where it's, you know, possibly like an arranged marriage and it's not going to end well, but in the end, you know, it really, it has a happy ending. And, you know, I was so fulfilled by that because I'm so not used to that, uh, being a female and reading a lot of novels written both by female and, you know, male authors, where a lot of times I expect for, for the woman in the story to be let down. Um, and I was thrilled to read so many different stories in this novel where I wasn't let down. <laughs> and I was allowed to envision a, a bright future for these characters, which was so lovely and, and new. <laughs> Uh, another, you know, question that I had was regarding um, regarding that, frankly, feminist challenges the idea uh, that feminism is a monolithic movement. Um, you know, how do you think that a book like Frankly Feminist can touch folks who are possibly, you know, the male voices? Um, since it's such a, a Jewishly focused novel, you know, how can it touch folks that are not in a Jewish space? You know, do you kind of foresee that happening? I think it's already happened if we judge by reader comments, by okay. you know, consumer reviews that come across on Amazon or on Goodreads or through any of the independent bookstore sites, which I love. Uh, there we are hearing from people, I'm not Jewish, but I loved having the insights into a tradition or traditions that aren't my own and so on and so on. Uh, and we've also heard from men, as with Lilith Magazine, where about 10% of our readers are men. Um, there have been men commenting on the book and also uh, conducting interviews for the book and reviewing the book. So that's been that's been very interesting. Um, I, I think that when we talk about what makes this book feminist, and I get asked that a lot, as you might imagine, mm -hmm. it's not only that the stories foreground women, but the women are indeed the subjects. We're very accustomed to reading fiction, even very great fiction, where the point of view is that of a male. Mm -hmm. And here, all the stories bring us experiences refracted through the, the eyes, the ears, the skin of women. And, and one interview said to me recently that she she believes that there is a kind of radical empathy in feminist stories. And I thought maybe that's it also, that we give ourselves over to the characters, just as you described, Alyssa, the, the story Persian Wedding by Gina Nahai. The, uh, it's a story of a young woman in an arranged marriage, the husband-to-be is much older and very wealthy. And like you, almost every time I read the story, I'm sort of waiting, even though I know how it ends, I'm yeah. waiting with bated breath, you know, thinking nothing good is going to come of this. And um, I'm taken aback sort of every time. There is that empathy for a life not our own. Yeah, absolutely. 
And with that empathy, you know, Anita, you wrote the foreword for this book, and I'm so curious to know, you know, how did you come up with the the subject matter that you wrote about in your foreword? Um, and could you elaborate a little bit on the themes that you decided to focus on? Well, um, I, you know, I, I think I said the obvious, which was what well, started with when I was in college, I was assigned all these, you know, this is, um, these um, collections by this is Native American poetry and this is African American poetry and this is um, mostly in poetry books. There were there weren't so many collections of short stories that I'm remembering anyway. Um, and you know it was like curiosities because they were outside of the canon. Um, and the same thing was true with women's stuff too. Um, although I don't remember there being a book of women's short stories particularly. Mm -hmm. um, although there there would be collect you know Tilly Olson's collection of short stories, which I thought was spectacular and I think changed my life. Um, she happens to be a Jewish woman It's and it's sort of embedded in there somewhere, but um, in, they weren't examples like, like this. And this is in a funny way, a throwback to that because, um, and, and at the same time, and um, I don't exactly know how to say this, um, these stories could be published anywhere. Um, they could be published in a New Yorker, they could be published in any kind of magazine. Um, because they're really good stories. And um, they're not, you know, when you say, frankly, feminist, it's they don't have an agenda. There's no agenda here. There's the voice. Um, and it normalizes the voice. It normalizes women's voices in their diversity. Mm -hmm. And that's that's what's different about this than those other books. It doesn't stand for all women's writing. It doesn't stand for all Jewish women's writing. It yeah. just, um, it's just like a, a beautiful bouquet of voices that um, that are that are now audible um, right. and haven't been that the you know the one by uh, singer uh, the the sister the 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 older sister was she the older sister of the two uh, well known singers um, her voice was not heard uh, it was her mother burned the you know her mother burned the um, the manuscripts which is one of the most heartbreaking stories of, of, for any writer. Uh, and that's, um, but that's an outlier. These are women who wrote to be read and expected to be read. Uh, and however much they had to struggle to get published, that's why they wrote. They wrote to be read um, and with the expectation that they, and, uh, and, and willing to fight for and work hard for and submit many places before um, they were published. So there's a diff there's a real different expectation now than there was when I was in college reading those um those anthologies, which I've been getting rid of, actually, as I call through my um, through my collection and try to just sort of downsize a little bit. Um, they're yellowed. They're hard to read. They're really tiny print. This is very readable. <laughs> this print is, you know, it's, it's a lovely book. It feels good. It's not, you know, it's not a little tiny squished together um, anthology at all. And it's um, it's feminist in a very organic kind of way there's no there's a tendency I'm afraid still to see to hear the word feminist as uh, kind of a flag that you raise over um, over things and this is this is arguing in favor of women's rights um, and women's right to be at the table but it's um, it's it's deeper than that it's uh, it assumes that we belong at the table that we in fact we actually own this table this is the Lilith, this is Lilith magazine this is our table um, so there's a different, I think there's more confidence in some ways too, because of that. Um, and that confidence will inspire more confidence. And as Susan said, more, more voices from more different places. And of course the internet makes it so much bigger. So you can send up a flare and you don't know what corner of the world is going to respond to it. And that, that's really exciting. That's the, that's the upside of the internet. Um, is that it connects us and it also enables us to meet people, um, some of whom are around the corner um, and some of whom are on the other side of the world. So um, so this is, this is different from those books. Um, and there can be more and more, there can be another one, there can be Frankly Feminist too, which would be very different, very different yeah. um, pots to put the stories in very different kinds of uh, adjectives uh, to, to, to to look for stories for. And actually having written, having put this one together, Susan, I imagine um, as you and the, and the rest of the staff read, read what comes over the transom, what comes over the, uh, over the wire, all the old fashioned <laughs> work, uh, <laughs> um, 
if you, you know, think, oh, this would be this, this is, I love that filings thing, you know, it attracts different stories to get a story that goes, oh, I wonder what, what other filings would come under this category, which is different than the other ones we've had. So. And that is actually what happens to us often in the Lilith office, though we've been virtual for the past three years, obviously, but is that we are asked sometimes, well, what theme are you planning to focus on two issues hence? And I always have this sort of uncomfortable moment, like, uh oh, we're supposed to know six months in advance what we're going to put on the cover. It really isn't like that at all. The focus of each issue of Lilith takes shape as the contents of each issue start to get edited. And then we see how those nonfiction stories and sometimes the fiction in each issue relate to one another. So even when we are putting together our reported pieces and our memoir pieces for each quarterly issue of Lilith magazine, there is that sense of the iron filings being attracted to the magnet. We it's have- what makes the magazine timely. You know, it's like literary magazines don't work that way. Mm -hmm. um, and and I've, always, I've been struck by covers that were so topical. Um, and I thought, how on earth did they do that? And sometimes it's a little luck, but um, some story will break and it happens to be this, it, a week before it comes out. Um, it was just in the air. So it makes you look, I think, very good, <laughs> like you're way ahead of the curve in some ways, because you're alive to what's going on right now, uh, as opposed to, you know, I've got to get the next six uh, issues lined up so we know what we're doing, as opposed to being alive in the moment. So I think that's a real strength of Lulu. Well, thank you. It's nice to it's nice to have that acknowledged. That's wonderful to hear, Anita. It's also the case that we have so much news, not all of it positive for us as Jews and as women in this current moment, that um, almost everything that we might typically write about feels current. Mm -hmm. We had some issues, of, uh, some articles that we were working on that had to do with reproductive choice and reproductive justice, and lo and behold, <laughs> Roe v. Wade gets kicked to the curb and we publish an entire issue, the cover of which read, Our Bodies Under Attack. Wow. Very timely, very relevant, very powerful uh, indeed. I'm going to move us to some of the uh, questions that our audience has submitted. Uh, this first one is a doozy. It's a tough one, but I, I believe in us. Um, Anita and Susan answer, you know, as you will. How would you define feminist art or writing as opposed to just art or writing by a woman? Not an easy question, I know. Yeah, I, I, you know, I can just answer that first. I get, I get, I've been asked that. Yeah. Um, uh, the fiction I've written all centers on women's lives. Not all, almost a lot of Jews, but not entirely Jews. Um, and um, it that everything I write pours out of who I am and who I am is an American English speaking, uh, Jewish, uh, college graduated um, feminist. And so it's gonna, all of that comes out, but it's not, it's not to teach, it's to tell a story. I don't know how to tell a story that doesn't use all those parts of me. So I don't, you know, I don't think of my writing as, <laughs> you know, is it, is, it a, is it a woman's book? Is it a feminist book? Um, it's a, my books are about, people and they're mostly about women's lives and about I sort of focus on women's friendships mm -hmm. and I've always thought that that was radical because women's friendships have been distrusted so centering women's friendships to me comes out of my feminist uh and out of my life and out of my friendships with women but um I the, labeling stuff like this is it women's literature I would bridle at that this is is this a chick lit book um so I don't, I'm, I'm really not a big fan of those labels. I know that sounds chicken, but um, if these if these stories weren't really good, it wouldn't matter if the word, uh, frankly, feminist was on the cover. Well, one of the reasons that the book is entitled, frankly, feminist, to answer yeah. the, the question in chat, is that Lilith's tagline has for many years been independent, Jewish, and frankly, feminist. Hmm. And the frankly was an important part of it because 
um, we could substitute, but we wouldn't have had the lovely alliteration, the consonants of frankly feminist. We could have said unabashedly feminist mm -hmm. or unashamedly feminist, not as Anita points out in, nobody ever calls men strident, so I'm hesitant to say, not in a strident way, but you know, in, the, in, in my introduction to the book itself, um, Anita wrote a beautiful foreword, and then I felt the need to highlight a little bit what went into our thinking as we put the book together. And uh, what I said there is that each of us brings, just as you said, Anita, that you are who you are and here are your identifiers. We bring multitudes to every encounter. You know, we have to um, identify ourselves sometimes in a, or we think we have to identify ourselves in a singular way, but our identities, and we said this in Lilith long before intersectionality became a buzzword, but we noted that particularly for women, we find ourselves charting our identities on a grid sometimes. You know, am I a, a French major who's a Canadian, who's a lesbian, who grew up in Tanganyika, who, you know, what whatever are those multiple parts of our identities, and it's those complexities and an acknowledgement of the complexities that I think make for good fiction. And in this case, I think make for good feminist fiction because these are stories that center, as I said before, that center mm -hmm. women's stories and also uh, amplify women's voices. This is not Ernest Hemingway. This is not Philip Roth. Nobody reading these stories would mistake them for something that is a product of one of the uh, great male heroes of American Jewish literature. Right. And, you know, as you noted, it's kind of like the dichotomy between are you a Jewish American or an American Jew? I remember being asked that in middle school. I <laughs> still to this day. Oh, no. It's so confusing. It's so confusing. Why would you ask that to a 12 year old? I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, that strange dichotomy. And then when you pull in all these different, you know, like you said, identities, it just gets harder and harder. Um, but another question, which is which is pretty interesting, we might have covered it a little bit in the beginning, but I do want to ask you know, how has the understanding of what a feminist is changed over time? And, and maybe you have seen this within the, the submissions from 1976 up until, you know, 2022. Well, I think it, the late, it's a label um, mm -hmm. that has been defined largely by the media um, and misdefined a lot by the media. Uh, and uh, the word strident, which you threw out there a minute ago, <laughs> Susan, uh, that was sort of, that was one of those words that got attached to feminism all over the place. And, um, and it was, I think it's because of the shock of what, what women were saying is that we're people, we're not being treated like people. Right. Um, and that's the radical inside of feminism is that women are human beings. That's it. Everything follows from that. That's so, rad but that is very radical. Um, it's like saying America has a racist past and mm. people are still freaked out about that. Um, it's it's true. It's obvious. We can talk about it, but um, it still scares the crap out of people. And I think it still scares the crap out of a lot of people for women to be saying we are human beings. This is really around the reproductive rights stuff at this point. It's like making, pretending that women aren't people um, and and enforcing laws that make women not people, that these bodies are human bodies. So to me, that's been, that's always been what feminism was. Um, the political movements to, um, to get women rights and to protect women in the workplace and, and so on and so forth. Um, those are the political arms and, and the public, but underneath it all is this notion, this radical notion, human being. I think, that, I think what feminism has unleashed is continuing to, yeah to be felt and will be. I mean, we're talking about undoing thousands of years of culture and right. it's going to be more than a couple of generations. Change um, takes time. That's for sure. This is a big one. This is yeah. like all of it. This is global. It's very deep. Um, yeah. And it's, uh, and, and the progress has been made and progress has been pushed back again. Whenever there's progress, it's pushed back against. So, yeah. Uh, so this is part of the progress. <laughs> is there a particular, um, yeah. when you tilt the prism and you look at this also from a Jewish lens, we are struggling 
within a minority culture that you know both is proud of and uneasy about its minority status, but sort of doesn't mm -hmm. want internal trouble. Uh, you know, don't don't report on various kinds of abuse going on with clergy in Jewish settings. Don't right. report on. We don't. You know, this is old news, of course, but. I think there is an additional burden for women in any culture that the struggle is both to enact what has to be enacted uh, to support women's rights and at the same time to do battle against the constraints that are delivered unto women from individual traditions. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. you know, one has heard any of us who are active in the civil rights movement that you shouldn't talk about sexism in the civil rights movement because it's going to undermine the movement. You know, you shouldn't talk about bad things that go on in Jewish life and how women are often put down or ignored because it will not reflect well on all Jews, et cetera. Yeah, no, we, a few months ago, we had um, Alana Zockman, uh, the author of When Rabbis Abuse, and it was a truly enlightening session with her to learn about the nuances that go on behind the scenes, and that is definitely part of the Jewish feminist fight, 100%. You know, the thing you said before about are you a Jewish American or are you American Jew, that's intersectionality, you know, mm -hmm. that's what that is. We we ha we are an intersectional, and we're, we're Jewish, we're American, we're women. Um, on and on, but th th all those things intersect. And um, so it's complicated. We're complicated. It's not, it's not, we're not one single thing. And I, yeah. I think I mean, women know that um, if you have a family and you have a job and you have a parent and you have whatever, you know that you're taking, you're, you have lots of different hats that you're wearing, lots of different roles that you're playing. Um, and um, it's it just, that 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 dichotomy Jewish American American Jewish what, where are your loyalties yeah. uh, want to divide you into pieces when and when you think about that we're all we're, it's all one thing together we in, all those things intersect into a whole it's not like there's there's a piece here and a piece there they are connected and that also challenges the the way we think of things in boxes I think yeah absolutely people want things to be neat and you know. They can, not, they can Jewish women are not neat. <laughs> right. Yeah. If you want it We're to be neat. Complicated. <laughs> yes. Uh, agreed. <laughs> we bring yeah. our complicated selves into yeah. all of these interactions. Yes, 100%. And I would just say, you know, with this book, right, it absolutely details that complicated narrative as well. And it gives the true essence of Jewish women, you know, from not just, you know, a, a feminist lens, but Jewish women inherently and like who we are and what uh, our history is and how we've come to where we are today which is, you know, part of the excitement of these short stories. Uh, we have time for one more teeny question. And this one is perfect to finish it off. People want to know when's the next book coming out? Are you going to take the ones that didn't make it in this one and, and put it in another book? <laughs> I know we, we, we dreamed up about it a little bit earlier, but you know, truly are there plans for, for more volumes? I think it would be tremendously exciting to see lots of Lilith books. We have fabulous memoirs that we've published over the years, lots more terrific fiction, some of Lilith's investigative reports. I'd love to see a book of rituals that we've published, new rituals and celebrations that Lilith has published over the years. Um, certainly, Anita, you know from these marvelous things from your Jewish baby book of many years back, there's so much that has gone on in the last four decades that it would be entertaining to have between covers. And especially now that I've learned to understand that the adorable look of this book with what is called French flaps. Who yes, French flaps. Now that we know all of that, we're ready to do, you know, the multi-volume Lilith series. Um, no, we will see what happens. No promises. This was right. a lot of work. I have yeah. right. been there, there. So we say, you know, we we yeah. without vows, yeah. right? We are still running a magazine. There are still, for most of us, only forty eight hours in the day. And you're still promoting this, which is which is also a job. Yeah. So this is um, let yeah. let's let Lilith bask. 
<laughs> yes, bask in the glory that is frankly feminist. That is our time for today. Go out there, buy the book, support Lilith Magazine, check them out online as well. Sign up for a subscription. And thank you so, so much, Anita and Susan. It has been a pleasure to hear from you, to learn more about your book, to learn more about you as individuals. And we greatly, greatly appreciate it. Thanks to the audience for joining us on Maven. And we'll see you next time. Thank you.